Today, in a nutshell, we're going to talk about robotics, past, present, and future. Our goal is to create a roadmap and try and figure out what are some of the next steps that we have to solve in order to keep moving things forward. And to do that, we're going to look at a comparison to computer technology adoption life cycle. Uh, we're going to look at the modularization process, basically how things go from proprietary all the way down to open standards. And uh, finally, in the end, I hope to seed some ideas into people's minds about what we can do with standards and how they can move us forward and things that we as a community need to do here in order to spread robotics out further uh, to other people as well. So first of all, who am I? Who's talking to you? My name is Matt Trossen. I'm the CEO and founder of Trossen Robotics. Uh, primarily, we're known as an online retailer. We sell everything from the nuts and bolts up to the motors, to the controllers and servos, to full-blown systems. We like to bill ourselves as the world's first hardware store for hobby developers, or robotics developers. We sell to hobby and education, and uh, low-level research, and pretty much everybody's interested in robotics. What's interesting about this is it gives us sort of a, a bird's eye view of the marketplace, because we talk to all of the different people that are building robotics, and we see a wide range of where robotics is being used. On the other side, we get to talk to all of the different vendors that are building uh, robotics components and see who's in the game. We get to see what happens with uh, the evolution of products. We get to see them come and go. So a lot of what you're going to be hearing today is our uh, observations that we've seen from that unique bird's eye view as a retailer in the marketplace. So, now that you know about me, I'll tell you what I see when I look out into the crowd. And I look at a room full of unreasonable people. And I'll tell you why. It's because the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. And that's what we are as engineers, as scientists. We're fussy and the world's not good enough for us. So we start asking questions like, why can't we do it this way? Or wouldn't it be easier to do it that way? Instead of getting up and getting a beer ourselves, we go into the basement and start building a robot. It's going to take us five years to figure out to get the beer for us. It's not reasonable. So now that I've insulted the crowd right out of the gate, I'll finish the quote. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Really, and everything that we're doing is because somebody said that it wasn't good enough and decided to build something new. So I applaud you for all being unreasonable. I'm unreasonable myself. It's a good thing, because we're the people that move the world forward. One of my goals uh, was also to kind of fire everybody up a little bit. What we're doing in robotics, it, it's hard. You know, bringing a new technology to market is never easy. It takes a long time. There's a lot of starts and stops. There's a lot of dead ends, and it's very frustrating. So I think it's very important for us to remember what it is we're doing and how big this is. Every few decades, a new technology comes along, and it's not just a small step forward. It's not just an improvement on something else. It's a game changer. It's a game-changing event that changes the face of humanity forever. And make no mistake about it, robotics is one of those game-changing technologies. So we're going to talk about robotics more on a, on a micro scale and talk about it in the past few decades. But I thought just for fun, for a few minutes, let's take a look, let's take a step back and look at robotics and how it stands in humanity's time scale. And it's really interesting because there's some insights that we can grab from that as well, so we understand what it is we're doing. You know, often we're so focused on what we're doing with our nose down in the desk, <coughs> we forget the big picture, the big scheme of things, and what we're doing is going to change the world. So we go all the way back to the beginning. First thing we did was figure out fire, right? Learn how to create light and heat for ourselves when we needed it. And that was the first thing that started to, to boom the population for us as a human race. And after that, we got to domestication of crops and animals. And that made us move, leave behind lives of hunter-gatherers and move towards city-states and eventually city-nations. After that, we learned how to work metal and our tools started getting better. Our productivity went up. Originally, they were very simple tools, farming implements, and eventually we got to things like gears and screws and hinges and complex machines. We took that metal and made it pretty impressed with it. This was our first information age. Information took its first leap down in cost, and it wasn't for the rich anymore. We actually, this was our first database. We started making books. People could start stacking technology on top of each other. Then came the steam engine, 1800s. An economy that was based on manual labor became an economy based on machine labor. Our pro productivity exploded at that point. Internal combustion engine came after that. The world started to shrink. Goods started to travel farther. People could communicate easier. After that, we found electricity. And this is a big one. Now we're getting closer to our world as roboticists. Electricity allowed us to pump. Uh, energy as far as we want it to, and when it's got there, we can convert it back into mechanical energy with the electric motor, which some call the second industrial, industrial age. Now, with electricity, we started building logic circuits with uh, vacuum tubes. Vacuum tubes made electronics possible, but the transistor made them feasible. 
So we have a sheet, we made it small, and it made it as much energy as vacuum tubes. Eventually, the computer came around. The computer automated mental labor in the same way that the steam engine automated physical labor. So what used to take a room full of engineers to do uh, only takes a few at this point with computers. And that was the great revolution that those came with. Which brought us the internet, which shrunk the world again. Basically, that was the second coming of the printing press. Information became cheaper again. Now we find ourselves today with robotics. So now if we look at it, robotics is the next step in this evolution from fire all the way through. There's two main themes if you look at this. It's all about productivity, but there's two. One is with manual labor, and the other is with mental labor. Information. Robotics is where these two things are going to intersect for the first time in a very, very powerful way. So it's fun to look at it this way, so we just want to know that what we're doing, it's hard, we're early. A lot of us are thinking about a world that's way out there and a lot of people can't see it yet. What we're doing is extremely important when we think about it.